Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Under the Hood. I'm so excited to have my friend and colleague Kelly Quo with us. Uh, all the way, all the way, it sounds like a basketball, all the way, <laughs> Haley from, <laughs> all the way from Nevada, 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 Nevada. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, now they've also done this thing, I was just saying as we were going live, that Facebook has changed their, their format for live videos, and so when you... When you start a live video via Zoom streaming to Facebook, it starts playing it for you in the background with audio, which is really not helpful. <laughs> so I was like, why am I hearing myself speak? Huh, here's why. Um, if you uh, are interested, you could go to my Facebook page and see our little video that's on there and share it to your social media. I'm okay. going to do that uh, myself right now to my other pages so that we can find as many people as we can to watch this incredibly brilliant conversation about to take place. Um, so yeah, okay. I'm sure. Let's see if we can be page. brilliant and very good. Let's share that to my page. Yeah, and I'll kind of keep an eye out for for comments and such uh, should they come in, which I encourage always. Um, so Wait. I'll give a little little background. I'm I'm like ninety eight percent sure that the first time that you and I met was at Seattle Opera in 2010 when we were doing Falstaff together? Or was or had we met before that in New York? We had not officially met person to person, but I had heard you in audition uh -huh. as an artistic administrator at Opera Pacific. Opera Pacific. So I oh was gosh. working at Opera Pacific in 2001 to 2006. So I'm sure at some point in there, you auditioned for us in New York. I'm sure I did. And I'm sure I still them. have comments about that audition. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. I would love to hear those. I would love to hear those. Um, so yeah, the first time we met person in person where we actually got to get to know each other was on that fall staff. And that was such a, um, for me, I was so thrilled to make my debut at Seattle Opera in that season as Germont back in, in, in the fall. Um, I think that was like October, September, October, I was there. And like near around the last performance, Spate came up to me and he's like, uh, Weston, uh, hey, uh, listen, would you, would you want to come back and sing, sing forward for us uh, in the gold cast uh, in February? And I was like, yeah, of course, <laughs> absolutely. Of course, I had never learned Ford. I've never even seen Falstaff at that point, I don't think. I was so green to that repertoire. That, Germont was my first role in the Verdi Rep, and getting into it, I was just absolutely terrified um, and excited and, you know, all the emotions. And um, what I remember most about that gig, well, I remember a lot of things, right? I met a lot of really cool people. Peter Cazares directing that show, um, Stephanie Blythe singing quickly, and Peter Rose uh, as Falstaff, and then Ashraf Suelem, he and I met there and became such great friends. You being there as as the coach repetitor kind of person in, in all of our rehearsals, and it was just such an incredibly supportive environment. Fritza conducting. Um, <laughs> Anya Matanovich was... Uh, Anya, yes, the Nanetta. Nanetta right. And Sasha right. Cook was Meg. Absolutely. absolutely. World-class cast. Yeah, it was such a fantastic cast. I mean, all of the people that were in there, um, uh, from top to bottom, I mean, every, every single component to that production was so fantastic. And I just absolutely loved the production. The idea of, you know, for, for those who might be watching that are unsure of what I'm talking about, um, we started when the audience came in and we walked in in costumed street clothes. So what Ford would be wearing in whatever that year was, 2010. Uh, that's 11 years ago. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. but, um, we would walk on stage and then they had this big wardrobe center stage and we would get our costumes out and then we got ready on stage. And like Spate walked across the stage with his two dogs <laughs> and Fritza came on and gave people notes and stuff. And uh, did you ever make an appearance on that stage? Like, no, as a repetitor, Weston, you have to remember my last day of service is piano oh, right. dress rehearsal, yeah, okay. and then I'm off contract. So, of course, of course, but yeah, that was just that was such a fun. We were taking pictures. In fact, I've got a picture. Hold on a second. This is crazy. 
I've got a picture on my wall that I took of me and stuff. <laughs> That's on stage with the house behind us mm -hmm. uh, from that production. How crazy is that? Anyway, um, I'm so glad that we met then. And then we, we, uh, we met up in an airport. <laughs> we had, we had, yes, we did. We, we randomly were, what was that, Atlanta? We Atlanta. Like P.F. Chang's in Atlanta? Like, yes. I don't even remember when that, that was. But. Fateful day you were en route to an engagement that shall remain nameless. Right. I don't even remember where I was going, so I'm sure that was. Well, you didn't get there that night. I didn't. I, oh, I ended up having, how do you, I don't, I don't know. I, I literally can't even, I, I remember that we, that we, saw each other in the airport, but I don't remember where I was going. I don't remember anything. About we it. both had layovers. I believe you were headed to Dallas, but I could be incorrect. Oh, okay. 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 But you were in, headed there for an engagement and um, our layover meeting dinner lasted a little bit longer than we had planned. And we ran to your gate and they had just closed the door <laughs> and you had to make a phone call to the company saying, um, you know, I, I'm sorry, I tried to make my connection and it just didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, this been the night. Listening. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We we had we had some lovely conversation, maybe a couple drinks, and then I was like, Oh, I think my flight's leaving like ten minutes ago. That's right. I remember that. <laughs> oh well. That was good times. Yeah. So what have you been doing since? No. <laughs> <laughs> You've been everywhere. I mean, but but so, you know, the premise of this show, let's say, let's start with that. You know, it started off with me talking to singers because, you know, as you are aware in the process, that first day, we end up getting up and singing for each other. You know, we do a whole sing through the show. And sometimes you're familiar with people singing and other times the, you might be singing with somebody for the first time. And so you get to hear these voices and you're just like, wow, that's, you know, wow, you sound fantastic. Oh, what a gorgeous voice. And at the break, you know, halfway through or maybe at the end, you might go up to one of your colleagues and be like, I'm just such a fan of your singing. You sound great. But rarely does the conversation go into how do you adjust vowels through the passaggio? And, and when did you start learning how to do that? And has that been something that you always were so great at? Or did you? And so that was what I wanted this show to, to kind of become as, a, as an opportunity to sort of lift the veil um, and, and help young singers realize that, you know, the polished final product that they might see on stage is not where any of us ever started from or even started the rehearsal process from, right? This is hours and hours and hours of working with conductors and directors and coaches and everything else. And so even a step further in that discussion, I think it's really interesting to hear about what the struggles and challenges technically were for that individual or continue to be for that individual or was that when they went from one type of repertoire into another type of repertoire you know and so um as i've sort of shifted or added i should say um pianists and and now you're my first conductor to talk with i would right. love to hear from your perspective of like I know you as a pianist, you know, was that your first instrument? When did you get started with that? Let's start there. Where, when did you get introduced to music and was it on the piano? Well, yes, it was. Uh, I was four years old, apparently the story goes. I, was, I grew up in Northeastern Oregon in a small farming community. And we went often to the area called the Tri-Cities, which is in Southeastern Washington, made up of Pasco, Richland, and Kennewick, and they had a department store. That's the only city really close by that had any kind of department store. Okay. And apparently there was a plastic piano, and I started banging away at it at age four, and my parents took that as a sign that maybe they should introduce uh, their children, my younger brother and I, um, to the piano. So they bought an upright piano, which is still in my parents' home today. Wow. And that's really how music started entering our lives. Now. In my hometown, there was actually multiple piano teachers, but there was one who was producing um, very good talent at the piano, and my mom wanted us to get into her studio. Mm -hmm. I was four, and my brother was two, and, my, and this teacher thought we were maybe a little bit too young to start piano lessons, but they suggested we start Suzuki Violin with her son, who was in high school. 
at the time. And that's what we did. Because my mom's thinking was, if we started Suzuki violin and performed in these recitals with the piano teacher playing those recitals and we displayed some kind of promise that maybe we would then be accepted into her studio. Right. My mom was thinking very far ahead like that. And that's exactly what happened. And so I played violin and piano until my teacher ended up going to Oberlin from my little town of Hermiston. Amazing, of all things. And he wow. now plays in the Oregon Symphony in the first violin section. So it's was very, very fortuitous that I ended up in this hometown and we studied with this piano teacher all the way until I was a junior in high school. And violin we had to give up because after my teacher went to Oberlin, he sent us to his teacher uh, who lived in Pendleton a little bit, about maybe 45 minutes away at that point. And she unfortunately died of cancer uh, oh. within a couple years of studying with her. And there is no orchestra program in Hermiston, Oregon. And the nearest orchestras were in communities uh, like Pendleton and Walla Walla and the Mid-Columbia Symphony in the Tri-Cities. These were my hometown orchestras. They were close within an hour drive, and um, but I couldn't play violin anymore. We tried a couple of teachers, didn't work out, so I picked up clarinet. And that is actually how I got into music school, was clarinet. Because I played clarinet from sixth grade all the way into college. And did you, do, did you do marching band? Of course. We actually, if you can believe it, Weston, we had in our heyday, in a school of 1,000 people, we had 225 in the marching band. Holy cow. People That's went, amazing. People went to the football games to see our halftime show because our football team wasn't particularly rocking, shall we say. Right, right, and right. So we had people stick around for the first half, then watch the halftime show, then leave. <laughs> and... <laughs> This is a credit, Weston, to, we had one high school band director, one junior high band director, and four elementary schools that all started in sixth grade. And between these two gentlemen, they taught the sixth grade bands between the both of them. Right. And then I think there was one assistant. That's it, except for maybe somewhere between 5%, 5% 2%, something like that, who took private lessons of any sort on their instrument. Everything else was taught by these two band directors, and we were com competitive. I mean, I think in my senior year, we were like third in the state in marching band with Portland schools and Eugene schools that were very well funded, that had, you know, fancy smancy uniforms, and we had like Walmart, well, theme Walmart, it was like Goodwill at the time, and we had these feathers that were like, looked like a very, very aged goose had <laughs> given up a feather for each person's hat. That's what we were wearing, and... Uh, Gosh, it's a real tribute, tribute to these band directors who come out to these rural school districts and give everything. What's really, really funny about this, question is that I remember thinking in high school that this band director was old. He had children, he had everything, and just relative to our age. And so later on, we met up. Um, I don't know, I was probably in my 30s by that time. And I said, how old were you when you were teaching us in high school? He goes... 26. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's amazing. I think about we that must... all the time. I, I think about my, you know, when I started as a freshman, I remember my first voice teacher having his 40th birthday and being like, he's so old. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we must have looked like, well, you must now, and, and I must have, in when I was teaching at the University of Texas, just looked like geezers, just know, way right? past expiration. The gray, the gray beard doesn't help at all. It just helps. Oh, me. and this certainly doesn't help either. So. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> no, but piano right. was my main instrument. So that's, to answer your question, piano was my main instrument. And even though clarinet was what got me into, um, into college, thanks to a recruiter that went through Northeastern Oregon looking for scholarship yeah. opportunities. And, I, you know, in a room, I don't know, one-fourth the size of my hotel room, I played unaccompanied clarinet for about 10 minutes on the recording, you know, in the days of tape recorders. And right. then I sent in a video cape of my piano playing from a competition I had just done. And I got a full ride to- Where did you end up going to undergrad? University of Oregon, so a state school. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I applied to six schools in aerospace engineering. I don't know if you knew that. I, I did was, not know that. I had not intended to pursue music because I'm the eldest son in an immigrant Chinese, Taiwanese family that, you know, typically following the stereotypes, I should have been pursuing something like medicine and engineering and 
very, very typical careers, okay. and that was my intention. Did I, your family encourage that? Our aerospace or music? Aerospace. <laughs> they were very supportive of that, and had I got in, into any of my top three schools, I probably would have done that, um, oh. but I got waitlisted. And then my choices were between going to my fourth through sixth schools and paying money or going to music, music school in University of Oregon for free. And wow. so there was a little negotiation and I ended up going to University of Oregon on a condition that I would double major in physics for two years. And then after two years, if I sh didn't show any promise towards music, I would then transfer to an engineering program. Wow. That's, yeah. That's that's unbelievable. Uh, so when you initially went to study music, were your parents supportive of that, given those negotiations that you that they made? Sure. I mean, they made a lot of trips to see you know, performances. Oh, my gosh, Wes, I have to tell you. So there's this, when I was playing clarinet and my younger brother was playing trombone in high school, there weren't any teachers really in the area mm. of my hometown well, I should say we had outgrown the ones that were in our hometown, and they supported us going to Portland for lessons. And so Portland is a good three-hour drive away from my hometown. Oh, wow. So once a month, my family and I and my brother would travel to Portland in our family van. We'd wake up at the crack of butt in our pajamas, our onesies, whatever we were wearing, and the back seat of the van would fold down. My brother and I would be sleeping. It'd be dark. We'd leave. And then in Hood River, which is about an hour and a half, halfway point, we'd wake up, stop at the McDonald's, eat breakfast, change. And then for the last hour and a half, my brother and I would take turns practicing for 45 minutes in the family van as we were driving. So you were playing clarinet and he was playing trombone? Not at the same time, but yes, we would. <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, the there are a lot of things I would do for my children, coffee. Weston, but there are a lot of things I would do for my children, but that is not one of them. Yeah, I hear you. Um, there, there are reasons why updated vans have headphone, Bluetooth headphones for the entertainment systems. And... <laughs> wow. Yeah, so can you Bless imagine that sacrifice? My, my parents were angels in terms of and heroes and dedicated to their children and music. And I think just dedicated to their children, but not yeah. necessarily expecting them to pursue it as a career. Right, right. Until it became more financially feasible to do that. Right, right. You know, and that once I made the decision to do that double major, they were very supportive. Now, it didn't take very long. It was like one quarter. That first quarter, I was playing clarinet and piano, and I was playing bass drum in a marching band for the University of Oregon. So there went all of my Saturdays in the fall, right? Wow. And then I was also taking honors physics with calculus. I was in the honors college for English. And that first quarter, I started getting, getting the Asian Fs. You know what? I mean, those are Bs, right? Bs. In class. Right. Yeah, exactly. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> so that was pretty much nail and coffin in terms of me feeling good about double majoring. I figured I had to really basically concentrate on one thing. So I just sort of made a deal with my parents to give me two full years to concentrate on music. Right. And if it didn't pan out, I would just transfer. Right. But fortunately, my teacher at University of Oregon, he was Horowitz's last student. Oh, wow. Okay. And he, I give him a lot of credit for breaking down my technique in a way that allowed me to build. And Let's talk I a little bit about that. I mean, so sure. f before we do, though, w when did you make the decision to sort of focus more on piano and let the clarinet go? My junior year. I was trying to do both, and I end up spending whatever time I had dedicated to clarinet practice working on reeds because I couldn't afford to basically play a reed out of the box like a lot of clarinets do, and if it doesn't work, throw it away. Right. I had to treat it more like an oboe or a bassoon where you actually had to work on the reeds to make them speak in a way that has uh, facility and all of that. Right. And when my minimal one hour or two hours I had dedicated to clarinet on any given day, if when most of that was dedicated to working on reeds, I said, okay, got to give that up. And I just made a choice towards piano. I, you know, I felt more attached to the piano anyways yeah. by that point. Yeah. So when you, now going back to when you were working with um, Horowitz's last student, what was his name? His name was Dean Kramer. Then he just he, retired recently. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you started really focusing your energies towards 
lessons with 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 this man you say he broke down your technique what what was it that you were doing technically up until that point that he felt needed to change and how did how did you how did you feel about him wanting to change that you know i mean i think it's so interesting with with pianist technique it, it's not exactly the same as like a, a singer's technique in the sense that you know um it, it, and granted i have some pianist friends right but like i haven't really delved into those conversations until this and so i've talked a little bit about it with carrie ann a little bit about it with rochelle young a little bit about it with jj penna um and with myra Wong last week but uh or two weeks ago but um it's really fascinating to me the types of technical things like when i mean to a singer and maybe this is just i'm just a dumb singer <laughs> but when i start listening and hearing about what is involved in the technique of a pianist it's just really fascinating to me to hear about the different types of things that a teacher would look at and go no 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 no. you're not i mean i've i've always known you know with like wrist posture or just physical body posture um, and and making sure that you play with your body, but beyond that, I'm like, really, okay, I didn't know about that. So let's let's talk about that, the body yeah. posture and everything. So I was one of those people that was pretty much just raw talent, and I was I had a tendency to emote at the keyboard unconsciously. So I would be, no matter if the tempo was fast, slow, I would be, and not on purpose. And not and completely unconsciously, right? Wow. And I was I always got comments and adjudications and competitions like, you know, you move quite a bit. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I do. Whatever, <laughs> roll eye, big eye roll. And then I started watching a videotape of my plane, and I'm here going, you know, I'm seasick watching myself. I'm going, oh my god. <laughs> and so one of the first things he did was, you know, every single time I started doing that in our lessons, all he would do is put his hand on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And just bring it to my level of consciousness. He wouldn't right. say stop moving. He just put his hand on my shoulder and then let me keep on going for a little bit. And that helped, first of all, bring it to a level where it has to be. It has to be a conscious thing, right? Then then he could talk about what body weight and gravity does towards your technique. Now, for example, if you're trying to play something soft at the keyboard. What do you think about what happened if you added your entire head, which is the heaviest thing in your body, over your hands? Right. It basically forces you to work against this weight, to, and you're trying to play soft. So you're working against this heavy weight against your, your, above your arms, right. and it makes it much more difficult to play soft when you are fighting this, this weight. So if you in fact, go the exactly opposite direction and lean back just a hair. Now you're, you're only dealing with arm weight, wrist weight, and hand weight yeah. to a certain degree. Yeah. And you can control, I find at least, not everyone works this way, but I find that not having to add 40 pounds of head weight, I have a big head. You know, Trying to work against that with my arms makes it much more easy to control the lower ends of the, of the dynamic spectrum. Wow. And bringing that, and then likewise, if you want to play forte, if you're doing this, you're not incorporating any advantage of your entire body weight. Right. So if you lean in a little bit, now you're adding proportion of body weight that didn't exist. So that's one thing to think about. Or I that's had to think about a lot. So when he when, and he taught you that, was mm -hmm. he the first one to bring that to your attention? And when he did, was that just like, or like, oh okay? No, it was over a longer period of time, Weston, because I had. A lot of things to fix. I had a lot of things to fix. Like, I mean, like, I know you talked about with Myra the idea of finger legato. And I don't know if yeah, you know yeah. what that means, where well, you basically have one finger down and the other one plays before you've released the other. Right. And so, you know, she talked about spider movements and all of that and, and wrist. Like, so that's finger legato. That did not exist at all in my technique at all. Wow. And then more than that, I think the most important thing he ever taught me was pedaling technique. Interesting. And, and how, how, I mean, tell us, please. So most people at an early age view the pedal as on off, like a power switch. Right. It goes all the way down, goes all the way off. And then the left pedal, the unicorda pedal, which is one string, basically they use it as a 
soft pedal. You know, they basically put it down and puts it up. If you want it softer, you put it down and up. Look, I played on upright piano my entire life up until I got to college. So I didn't have a really luxurious, luxuriously um, appropriate piano to work out this type of pedaling. It really works for grand pianos in a different way. Now, he taught me that there are basically microscopic levels of pedal on both sides, and they can be used in various combinations. Wow. And that they are used for color, and they are not used as a crutch to connect notes because you cannot do it physically. It's not a substitute for legato. A lot of people just put it down and and they play and it becomes a wash and it becomes a crutch rather than um, something that is an independent color like you might apply straight tone you might apply different um, positioning of vowels in your in your mouth right the pedals serve as a different way and so now if you have for example 10 levels of pedal on your right foot and 10 levels of pedal on your left foot in combination you've now opened up an entire new world of colors absolutely and then if you add that to your to other variables of technique you can create orchestral textures that previously were not available to you wow. and you have to use your ear to adjust the pedals as opposed to just saying oh it worked on this piano it'd be like saying you have one way of doing it in this venue and then that's going to serve you everywhere that may not be the case you might be have to change it depending on the reverb that's in this particular uh, venue. An example of this is the venue that uh, our recital hall at University of Oregon called Bell Hall. When I was going to school, the reverb in that place was extensive. This was like a world-class chamber music hall and string players loved it because it basically had like a two second reverb. You can go oh, wow. and it would. Right. So what happened in that hall, Weston, was that we had our studio classes there once a week and we'd play our pieces and then We'd record ourselves, of course, and we'd have our studio mates there and a teacher. And we would use pedal. He goes, too much pedal. I'm like, I'm barely touching the pedal. Too much pedal. Because what would happen is with our finger legato and the pedal and the reverb, it became very difficult to distinguish articulation. Right. And then, so we would end up doing something completely without pedal. And, our t and he goes, that's it. And we're like, it feels so uncomfortable to do that up here. It really does. And it goes, don't believe me, ask your studio mates. And they said, oh, yeah, wow. it sounds great. And you listen to your recording because you're the only one who knows what you felt like you were doing. And then you can listen to yourself and analyze the combination of what was actually coming out and what you felt was coming out. And then even more importantly was the concept of tempo and how the idea of reverb can affect the concept of tempo. If you have a lot of fast notes and you can't hear them because the reverb is affecting the clarity of all those notes it Two doesn't sound before <laughs> yeah exactly so you if you actually play it slower so that you can hear more notes it sounds faster interesting so these are all lessons that i learned as a result of being in a studio class in an actual venue right. and that has been such a blessing because that tells me that tempo is there is no um Ide fix in terms of tempo. It's relative to the venue. It's relative to the instrument. It's relative to singers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that the whole time I was thinking like, well, you're, you're as a pianist, you know, you're constantly having to adjust all of those things. You're working with different singers, different venues, different instruments all the time. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, as the singer, we always, in, you know, I was always encouraged as a student and I encourage my students now never sing for the room that you're in always imagine yourself but i say that in a small studio right i say you know imagine yourself standing dead center at carnegie hall or whatever some four thousand seat venue that um because you know so often students approach their dynamic range which is only about that big right until they realize oh oh okay i can do that and um yeah it's just it's 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 interesting how how big of a role that that can play and then if you're changing all the variables it just requires a significant more time i would imagine a mm -hmm. amount of time rather um in the venue with the instrument working mm -hmm. with the singer so that exactly you rather than a practice room you know practice exactly. room is this small and so the ability 
the luxury of being able to perform in a recital hall and to test out what it needs what it means to really project in a different way and this is a small concert hall and we would like you say the teacher students to sing for a bigger space we would do that in our recital hall as well so we're using huge amounts of body to communicate the kind of projection that would be needed to project over an orchestra like a right. concerto right. which just like conducting someone can tell you what it's going to feel like to sing with an orchestra to play with an orchestra but until you actually do it you don't realize how much sound the orchestra is producing right right and, and everyone in a 45 piece orchestra could be playing their lowest possible dynamic that's healthy and it would still produce a pretty significant amount of sound that you would have to project over well and that's interesting because you know as a singer we feel like we're I'm, well i guess as a pianist each instrument no matter what it is if it's part of the human body or not has its limitations with how loud or how soft it can get, right? And so I would imagine when you're trying to play over a, a, a pretty substantial, you know, sound of the orchestra to a limit, right? I mean, like you can only do what you can do. Um, same thing with with us, you know, we're like, I'm pumping it out up here. I don't know, I don't know if you can hear me at all, but yeah, I mean, that's that's one of those things that is really, really tricky then you add into the fact if I'm 15 feet upstage and we've got curtains that come down in front and they were like, I can't even hear the orchestra, but I know they're cranking away. And so then they add the speakers on stage. This is, this is a ingredient that I think a lot of, you know, perhaps young singers, young students, young pianists are unaware of this, this dynamic of like how these puzzle pieces come together so that when you do attend a live performance and things somehow sound balanced, the amount of time and work that goes into that ingredient right there is pretty substantial. Absolutely. You know, the things you all work on with the squeedlow in, in, in order to really help um, that cut. Right. We work as pianists for the same thing in our articulation, how much pull um, at the keyboard and how much it's relative to wrist weight, hand weight, finger weight, arm weight, shoulder weight, body weight, all of that. If you're trying to play in the middle register as opposed to the upper register, which has much more brilliance because of the way the strings are sure. versus the bass, it's all different. Yeah, I mean, that's just, so, I mean, the fact that you have played a few instruments, anything other than the bass drum, the clarinet and the uh, piano. I played alto sax. The violin, and, violin, right. You yeah, and violin. Playing. I played alto sax in junior high because I was, as a clarinetist, frustrated with how much sound I was unable to produce on the marching band field because the clarinet, you know, is not meant for the marching band to be as, you know, it's not a trumpet, it's not a trombone, it's not a, doesn't have that natural right. uh, capability of projecting that much sound. So I went to the alto sax, I taught myself because I wanted to be, play a louder instrument. And then right. it had all these cool French horn counter melodies that were so cool. So yes, I played alto sax as well. So all of this obviously led you to the desire to be a conductor yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly no it was actually when i was in manhattan school of music i was studying piano with byron janice who was yeah. horowitz's first student and in my second year there i was playing i started playing for singers in their voice lessons to earn a little extra cash to pay for yeah. rent as you do in new york yeah. and it was those voice teachers marlena malice cynthia hoffman maitland peters that whole gang who started noticing my work and asked me if I ever thought about doing more of it. And honestly, I hadn't, but I was at that point thinking about applying for the orchestral performance program, which was new at Manhattan School of Music. And I was at that point playing piano for all of the orchestral concerts that inside the, the keyboard uh, orchestra, I was playing for new music um, because none of the pianists really wanted to do it. They were, were all, all constantly on solo. solo career. Exactly. And so I was like, I'll do it. So I learned a lot, watched a lot of conductors, played for a lot of conductors. So I was really interested in this program, which would have had me study with um, Harriet Wingreen, who was principal pianist of the New York Phil at the time. And that's where I was geared towards. And then they suggested that maybe I look into the program that Warren Jones was leading um, in Manhattan School of Music. And I thought, okay, um, sure. In my naivete, I thought, I'll apply for both programs. And if when whichever program gives me more money, I will do. <laughs> right. Can you believe that? 
Oh my gosh. So not knowing that the orchestral performance program was taking one person and Warren's program was probably taking one or two. And so at that point, I had never ever sung and played together in my entire life. And I remember deciding to bring Bartolo's aria from Notze because you know, I thought okay, it was- that's hysterical. When you mentioned um, the feather in your hat from the Goodwill marching band and you said that it looked like a goose, the first opera role that I ever did was Figaro in The Marriage of Figaro. And we did the Schirmer, you know, Ruth and Thomas Martin. And Bartolo's aria, as for that Figaro, I'll cook his goose. Every time. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear the word goose. That was, I don't know how many decades ago that that, that was my freshman year of my of, of college. But I always, whenever someone says goose, I'm like, you'll cook his goose. That Bartolo is going to. So anyway, okay. Yeah, yeah. You were saying. So I had I I decided to pick up Bartolo's Ari just because I felt like that was something that was sort of in my range, and so Christopher Fund I don't know if you know Chris Fund Tanner yeah and he was a good friend of mine and I'd been playing for some of his lessons and so he gave me my first Italian lessons ever and I started playing for um, playing by myself and trying to work in the the balancing act of singing and playing at the same time. And I did the audition and Warren's program gave me more money. Wow. And so I got you in. You got accepted into both. I got into both and. Screw you. God, can you imagine all the people? Naivete, that... <laughs> complete naivete. I got so lucky. So my studio that year, so I got my master's degree in piano and I started a second master's degree in vocal company. My studio that year was Craig Terry, Tomas Lausmann. <laughs> Stephen Philcox, myself, and Moshe Lonsberg. Wow. And that was our class of five. Wow. It was incredible. I had no idea really what I was how far, how, how far, where, where did you fit in that group? I mean, you know, you're, you're saying that you, you had prepared Bartolo's aria, which was the first time you'd ever even sung and played at the same time. And you're learning Italian from your singer friend of yours. Where was where was Thomas or Craig or, or whoever at that at that? Oh, time? I was the greenest of green. I mean, all of them had been playing for singers, and um, I had played for singers, but and I, but my repertoire was aside from recitals I'd played, right, was basically limited to the freshman soprano arias because, and I I have this very very worn Schirmer anthology of sopranos because that's what I was playing for. Right, 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 right. In fact, okay, so. Three months into my study with Warren Jones, I get called by Nats. And they said, they're looking for a pianist to play for their adult division of their finals in New York City. Okay. And they heard that I was a student of Warren Jones and would I do that? I said, sure. Right. It was in two weeks, okay? There were nine no, six people that I had to play for. Each of them had seven arias. There were 42 arias that I had, to, had to learn. In two and weeks. I had, I knew only six of them. <laughs> so I had to learn 36 arias and there was Du Bister Lenz, oh, wow. Du Regia, uh, the Largo, um, oh, yeah. Queen Mob aria, like all these big boys and big girls arias that oh, no. I had never played before in my entire life. So we had only 15 minutes the day before the competition to re rehearse with respective with singers. Singer. Okay. So my philosophy was to rehearse the this, this aria that they were going to start with. Right. And then talk through the rest. Uh -huh. And maybe rehearse the second aria if there was a good chance that like the one that we, the singer thought that they'd be asked to do. Right. So there was a baritone who said, I always start with Chouinard's aria and they always ask for the Largo. Okay. I said, fine. So we, Chouinard's aria is rather long. So we used most of the time to work out Chouinard. Yeah. We talked through everything. We did not get a chance to do the Largo. <laughs> I've never played it ever. Okay. And so I'm looking at the music. And there's that one spot, la, 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 yeah. Right, so you remember what's in the score? 
right at that yes, spot. Yes, there is no that that's like a tradition that people have just started doing. In the score, it starts right as the thing goes, right? It goes la la D natural. Yada, da, 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 right. Ah, right. Of right. Okay. So I'm looking at the score in the competition itself. He says la 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 la. And I'm waiting for him to get off of the G so I can go. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> and he's waiting for you to start. <laughs> and he is holding this thing for dear life at, may, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds, whatever it was. Oh, my and God. Audience starts to applaud. He takes a bow, walks off stage. We're done. That was it? That was it. Wow. wow. He did not win the competition. <laughs> I cannot imagine that he did. <laughs> but... My little lesson to be learned from that is that they didn't write anything in the score. And I didn't know the tradition. And they assumed that because I was studying with Warren, right, that, right. that this would be very familiar. And it should have been familiar to me, but I was beyond green. Right. And that's how I learned a big lesson. <laughs> and um, what's funny is that three months later, I got called from the Houston Grand Opera Studio because they had not found a pianist through their normal route of auditions. At least this is what was communicated to me. I don't know how true this was, but they called me and said, uh, can we hear you an audition in a couple of weeks? And I'm like, I don't have your audition repertoire ready, but I can play whatever I have prepared. Yeah. They said, that's fine. So I had prepared, you know, um, the typical Bohem all the way through Benoit's exit. I had yeah. the Componiste Serenetta duet from uh, Ariadne. I do the finale. Okay. No, no, not even that. I mean, uh, I had never played a complete. I think we had studied Cozy. We were studying Cozy at the time when I had this audition. So that was it. And I, I, my Mozart was Dove Sono. Mm -hmm. And um, so I played all those things and I had to sight read some, I think, some Wagner, some slow Wagner. I had to sight read. Two weeks later, I get a call offering me a position with the Houston Grand Opera Studio. And Warren was the first person to say, do it earn while you learn that yeah. those were his words earn while you learn while you learn and, and that's and i left the program i never completed the second masters wow wow so you were only there for what one year with warren yeah one yeah. so nine months yes one yeah. school year one school year yeah carrie ann matheson says ouch we've all been there she had the equivalent experience with otu palermo very early <laughs> <laughs> oh man I don't know who this baritone was, and I apologize, whoever it was, um, because that is just really weird. And I had this seance thing going on with this hotel light. I'm sorry. That's okay. I might just turn it off. Is that okay? That's fine. Oh, yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. good. Excellent. Oh, yeah. Very good. Perfect. It's fine. It's, I was like crystal ball going on. Right. You know, it's so it's so interesting. I mean, it, it, since, we're, since we're talking about this, have there ever been any other sort of... Um, moments on stage in performance where you've just been like what in the world just what's happening right now this oh yeah i can tell you my first experience in houston yeah let's so my it. first opera assignment in houston was aida you know that little mm -hmm. that little ditty i've sung it you know yeah well, i've sung amanadro i've never sung aida before i went to houston my first opera full opera experience was the pre just months before in ashland highlands Ashlan Festival, and it was Notze in English and Susanna of mm -hmm. Carlisle Floyd. Yeah. And then my first Italian was Aida. I had not been, my only access to Italian in my first year with Warren was Bob Cowart's Italian diction class. Uh -huh. That was it. So Aida, wow. And I am third pianist from the left because I'm the young artist pianist. They have two assistant conductors who are the main pianist for the show, and then me which means I play all the dance rehearsals, all the dance rehearsals. Mm -hmm. And I remember I got to play one chorus rehearsal of act two finale. And I remember I play a cover staging. We had many tenors go through that production. I'll tell you about, <laughs> about that later. But in any case, I got to play a cover staging. And um, that was my complete contribution to the rehearsal process until piano dress rehearsal. When unbeknownst to me, the first and second pianist on a show would be on stage conducting banda and chorus. Uh -huh. 
and I would be playing three fourths of the show for the first time with conductor Roberto Abado. Uh huh. Okay. And you found out the day of? I found out as I'm playing. <laughs> okay. Nice. Yeah. So I've never played for Roberto Abado except for one chorus staging. Right. And uh, of course, I could, I've played the dance music backwards and forwards. And I, you know, I played that ad nauseum because that's what I do. And that's really tough stuff. And I, I, I excelled at that. But as far as, a comp, you know, following a conductor, in the, it was my first time in a pit. Right. Of that size. And playing for that. And I ended up playing all of Act 1, half of Act 2, part of Act 3, and all of Act 4, something like that. I'm something And... I remember part in act two in the finale, we had stopped in piano dress because of something that needed to be done on stage. And they said, okay, start up again over the intercom, start up again at blah, 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 blah in Italian. Oh, no rehearsal number, just the text. The text. And I was like, <laughs> right. I could not find that to save my life. It felt like I was sweating bullets just trying to find it. And then, I, um, I got called, the person who was sitting behind the conductor called out a page number, but because I was using a different recording edition, the of page course. numbers didn't match. The plate numbers were wrong. Exactly. The page numbers just completely didn't match. And then Liasa, Larissa Diadkova, who was singing Amneris, started singing her part to help me find where I was supposed to be. And eventually I got there, but it felt like an eternity had passed right. by. Right. I Did was nobody still... just shouted out a rehearsal number? <laughs> I, I, well, they might have, Weston, but in the moment, I was probably so like, panicked. Ah! I was mortified, of course. Yeah. And, but somehow I finished the rehearsal. And after that rehearsal, Roberto Abado came down, shook my hand, and said, You can be a conductor someday if you want. Wow. I had never explored conducting. I was drum major in high school, uh, right. since senior year, but we know that's a completely different animal. But sure, he, sure. Before I even had any inkling of conducting, he told me I could be a conductor based upon how I played for him. Maybe orchestral texture in response to his conducting, whatever. He, he saw something that I didn't know yet. And you were probably freaking out. I mean, like you said, this is the first time you've been in that size of a pit. First time you played through Aida. First time, you know, I mean, that's, that's incredible testament to your artistry and to your skill set to have that one opportunity leave a comment from a bottle that said, Hey, you could, you could do this if you want. That's, in, that's amazing. Right. Wow. So then did, I mean, is that, is that where the real kernel kind of got going? And then you were like, yeah, maybe I can do this. So part of Houston's program was to give us some conducting lessons with Larry Radcliffe at Rice yeah. University, because yeah. we were on stage conducting Banda and chorus, and they didn't want us to embarrass the company or ourselves. So they gave us enough basic instruction on how to flap so that we could do that. And Larry is a fantastic teacher. He's a uh, professed, uh, he has a professed dislike for opera. So we didn't work on opera. Okay. We worked on, I think, Haydn, Beethoven. Jim Lau was my compatriot in oh, yeah. the I love Grand Opera Studio. And Jim and I would play uh, reduced score for each other in our lessons. We had like two lessons a year. Okay, like two lessons a year for two years. That was my entire uh, conducting experience until I left. And I left and I went to my first job, which was at Opera Pacific. And Opera Pacific ended up giving me my first uh, opportunity to conduct an opera. It was my debut. I was in my early 30s, which is very, very late mm -hmm. for a lot of conductors. Mm -hmm. And um, I had taken some lessons with Ken Kiesler, who runs a conducting retreat in Maine. And um, other than that, everything else I learned about conducting was basically through failing and learning. What were some of those bigger fails that you would say uh, for the conducting side of it? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so I remember in Opera Pacific, my first experience, I was their artistic administrator, assistant conductor, and principal pianist uh, for four of my five years I was there. Okay. And our artistic director, John Domain, who is a good mentor of mine, often had to attend meetings or he might wander from the rehearsal room to meetings and I would be left 
to conduct. The other rehearsal pianist who was hired for the show. He still and... does that in Madison. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so, he leaves and then Scott can do, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to go. <laughs> exactly. So sometimes I'd con conduct from the piano, but often I'd actually get a chance to wave my arms. And like the chicken and the egg, you actually have to have someone respond to you with your whatever motions you're doing in order to know if what you're doing has any effect. Yeah. Right. Of course, the best people don't need a conductor of some sort, and you know, best orchestras can really play without a conductor sure. easily, right? So, but as far as getting a response from a pianist and response from singers, that was my first time. And I got, you know, three or four years of that. And I remember, I don't remember who the turn note was. In Cuesta Raja, I'm, I was conducting this, and there was one time when I was about to give a cue and she wasn't, she was like, it was probably completely in the wrong spot. And I completely gave her a cue and she looked at me and she didn't even breathe. And I was stuck, I was caught up here. You were like, oh, oh, are we not going on? <laughs> and she gave me the glare of death, which was, I'm sure, very kind, but it felt like mortified because I was stuck up here, clearly not trying to brush my hair. <laughs> And then when she was ready, she breathed, and then we went. I was completely, it was like- And this was in a piano. You were playing piano? No, I was conducting. You were conducting, okay. So I, was con I was conducting the, the piano rehearsal. I got it. And that was just lesson learned, like be in touch, watch the body, watch the breath, watch everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, they gave me my debut, and it was La Traviata, like oh, yeah. um, Little Diddy. So, the story behind this goes, I was conducting second cast. And this cast was Jennifer Welch Babbage singing Violetta for the first time, Chuck Taylor singing his first German, Richard Troxell, mm -hmm. who sung a billion Alfredos by that mm -hmm. point. And they were originally not gonna have any rehearsal for me because I was a second cast. But they ended up giving us a rehearsal, mm -hmm. a dress rehearsal with orchestra, full costumes for the cat. It was mainly for Jennifer and Chuck because it was their first time out and they were just coming out of the Young Artist Program at the Met. Mm -hmm. So before that one dress rehearsal, I had been on a podium in front of an orchestra in my entire life, a cumulative 45 minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I conduct a lot of piano rehearsals, but as far as an orchestra, I got, you know, garbage time the last five minutes of some orchestra rehearsals when a kind conductor said, here's an opportunity. Why don't you go and conduct something? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Stephen Lord gave me the Polonaise of Onegin. And uh, I remember conducting the opening of Rigoletto. I remember conducting in Ken Kiesler's classes, uh, some of Beethoven 7. And that was it, 45 minutes total wow. until I stepped on the podium for the one dress rehearsal. And I remember things, some things going well, other things, you know, talk, people talk about the delay, right? When you put down your arm and you're, and there's a delay in response from the orchestra. Before you hear it, yeah. Before you hear it. And people can talk about that till the cows come home and you can think you know what it's gonna be, but until you are actually doing there and you're going, oh my God, <laughs> basically the entire thought bubble that's going on. And then you have to keep on going. Right. You can't stop and go, wait, why aren't you guys playing when I <laughs> Exactly. It's like <laughs> Is this thing on? Yeah. It's exactly. Exactly. And so I remember getting through that rehearsal. And then I th this orchestra are good friends of mine and they were all wanting me to succeed. Yeah. But a couple of the principals came up to me afterwards and said, You know, Kelly, you are hanging us out to dry sometimes. And I said, I know, I know. <laughs> because you, you obviously know when things are not going well. Sure. So I said, okay, I'm going to work on this. And I had a bootleg audio recording that one of the singers had made. Right. And that's it. This was like the day before video was really active. Sure. So I listened to that bootleg recording and compared it to what I remembered happened. Right. And that's all I had to study for one week. And then my one performance came a week later. And overall, I think it went pretty well. I remember one spot that was completely my bad, that we weren't absolutely 
that the orchestra responded to exactly what they saw. And that was bad because <laughs> I was not clear and they played it just like it was shown by me. And so, but here's the thing I've learned from my entire life. If there's something wrong, it's usually the conductor's fault. And I say that with complete humility because we're expected to be able to do, to work on this with very, very little actual practice with our band because it just is financially unfeasible. Sure. It's too expensive. So we're expected to be able to make a lot of quick improvement over a very, very short period of time before people stop hiring you. If you mm -hmm. fail too many times, people stop hiring you. Interesting. You get very, very few opportunities. So the fail and learn school is absolutely real. But what they don't tell you is that you have a finite amount of times to fail wow. before you stop getting gigs. So that was my first opportunity. And of course, wouldn't you know it, it was reviewed. Right. It reviewed the single double cast performance in Opera Pacific. And I remember, I, I mentioned this because I remember the review, which said something to the effect of, you can drive a Ferrari 55 miles an hour, but why would you want to do that? That was basically criticizing me for being too safe mm. and holding things pretty tightly, you know. And they were not incorrect because, gosh, I, I think I was just trying not to crash the Ferrari, quite well, honestly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine what that would be like doing that for the first time in a, I mean, you know, in a rehearsal, that's one thing, right? There's a bit of safety. There's a bit of, well, who cares? You know, okay, we'll fix. Okay, let's go back. Let's do this again, you know. But in a performance, when it's just really the, you know, first time taking it around the track, yeah, you don't floor it. You don't open it up <laughs> to see what 220 feels like. Yeah, you want to make sure you don't crash. <laughs> yeah. So even though it was accurate, I don't know what I could have done differently. And But at the same time, I caution my students who have taught, I said, look, would it have been different maybe if I just let go and thought only joy and just made music and whatever came out came out? Maybe. And maybe I should have done that. But at, in the time, in my whatever I was feeling, nerves or whatever you want to call it, that's how it ended up. Even though it ended up, as far as um, the, my friends said, you know, and who were musician friends who were out there, they said it, it turned out well. But at the same yeah. time, I realized there was a finite amount of interpretation I could do at that very young stage in my conducting career. Well, but it also to, taught me, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's hard to encourage. I don't want to, I want to say confidence, but I don't want to use that word. For any artist, to, when they're getting up and doing something for the first time, right? Like I find myself constantly encouraging my students, don't sing with timidity or caution. Don't be careful. Don't be timid. Don't be delicate don't be precious go but in order to do that you have to have confidence and in order to gain confidence you have to have done it you know and so <laughs> how do you how do you find yourself in that type of situation and not proceed with caution um when in fact that's <laughs> you know i i guess you could just say well who cares if the whole thing comes burning down in a in a whole flame of whatever you know but I think that, you know, you're too intelligent of a human to think about the financial responsibilities of the company. And what if this were to truly, you know, have a be a train wreck and then this would, you know, because those are things that we always sort of have in the back of back, back, back of our minds. But, but can you imagine being the administration thinking we need to give Kelly an opportunity to conduct, but he's only conducted 45 minutes his entire life. So let's do it. Right. I'm not sure if I would do that for someone, <laughs> to be quite honest, because I realize what's at stake. But to give credit to Opera Pacific and John Domain, who you know vouched for me and gave me the opportunity to learn and do this, I'm internally grateful. But yeah. there's a certain amount of being psycho that has to happen in order for you to be able to step on stage. You know, as a cover conductor, which I've did for all those productions and other places, your job is to be at the last minute, be ready to 
basically yeah. jump in with no rehearsal. And yeah. my debut at the Lyric Opera of Chicago and Porgy and Bess was done with no rehearsal. That was planned, but I didn't. I conducted, I think, the third and fourth performance with no rehearsal with the orchestra. Wow. And it's now to, you, to to what you were saying earlier. You know, amazing orchestras don't require so much of even a conductor standing there. But that with an opera, I mean. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it might be a little bit more nuanced than something that is, oh, I don't know, I mean, through composed or, or, I mean, I don't know. I would imagine that they are relying on you, um, at least somewhat, even if they've already gotten two performances under their belt for, for number three and four. So I think that, and I know certainly from our perspective on stage, we are always relying on the conductor. So, you know, that's got to feel a bit naked <laughs> going in there with yeah no absolutely which is why i prepared myself the previous summer i went on tour with the poor game best company in europe oh, and wow. put myself in a situation where i i think i had i was given 15 minutes to rehearse on the day of my debut otherwise that was it this was an orchestra that could play it blindfolded you know the bulgarian and how many performances did you get to do with that group that group i think i ended up doing three or four in munich um then i got to conduct some in in hamburg and um one in the Canary Islands in Spain. This is a group that um, New York Harlem Productions has been really good to me over the years and really helped give me the preparation that was needed to make my debut in Chicago under those circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I haven't done a lot of, well, I haven't done hardly any covering. I've been very fortunate that um, I've, I've spent most of my career on stage, but, um, the few times that I have covered, uh, the first time was I'd already sung the role of Sharpless, probably ten different productions or so, and it was a it wasn't really a cover cast thing. It was a double cast where there was a there was a cast that was going on for the first five performances, and then there was a second cast that did the second five performances. We did ten in all, and. Um, I definitely know that when we stepped out on stage, I had never been on st that stage before. That was my, no, no, I had been on stage before. I hadn't been on that set before. And so that was the first time um, sort of, you know, we had done it. It was at New York City Opera and we had done the rehearsals down in the basement. You know, I knew the staging, of course, but it was, it was weird to think like, I've never actually been in this costume and stepped out on stage and walked the, <laughs> I've never really done this before with, we didn't have a dress rehearsal, right? We just walked on, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it is a, it is a different feeling, a different set of um, emotions that kind of go through you when you have those opportunities. But, and then I think about my colleagues who have like truly been in a cover situation where someone falls ill and then they go on one of my best friends um, started his whole career that way. Brian Email, you know, he was covering Alanya. He got to go on at Covent Garden and, and cover it co at Scott. Oh no, no, Scott. I can't remember all the different places that he. But that's how that's how so many singers have sort of gotten their their whirlwind kicked off. So mm -hmm. it's interesting. It's really interesting. So now you're in a place where you are. Well, you're in a hotel room. You're on a gig. You're actually one of the few musicians that are back at it and are able to perform live. How amazing is that? I've been very fortunate, you know, there's a little bit of survivor's guilt because so many of our colleagues have not been able to work and I've been working consistently at least since December um, and oh, a little wow. bit before that. And I've conducted two live opera productions with audiences up to 700. Um, Where? That was Orlando Opera's Carmen, which was, um, we had two performances and then I think the house seated around 2,500 and oh, they were wow. able to put 700 in there oh, on in Columbus, right? They did Giovanni. And then Columbus, they did Don Giovanni in the, uh, in Kosai as a science museum. And we were in hotel gallery, not a hotel, uh, a museum gallery. Museum, yeah. And I think we seated 150, 160, something like that in there for a couple of performances. And then my orchestra and organs, we've recorded nine concerts with no audience. So five orchestral and four chamber music that I played piano for. Wow. And it's just been, That's you know, incredible. I mean, amazing. I understand what you're saying. I mean, I don't understand it firsthand because I have not had a performance since February 22nd of 2020. Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I, well, that's not total. That's not entirely true. 
I did a recital project for Austin Opera sometime in like June. They were doing that live from Indy Terrace thing that I did. And, right. Um, there's been a couple of online things, but I haven't really had an opportunity to like sing with an orchestra on stage in front of an audience. So I I certainly look forward to getting back to that. But I'm I'm actually really happy that you've been able to do it and thankful for the people who um, had the opportunity to work with you because that's that's pretty incredible that uh, that so many different organizations have been able to find a way to make it work. Now, this is not without challenges, of course, during the pandemic, right? Oh, sure. um, the singers in G Don Giovanni had to sing in these four by four by eight vinyl boxes that have negative airflow. Vinyl? Um, vinyl, clear vinyl all around, four by four by eight, no top. Okay. And that's what they mean by negative airflow in, in that they could take off, it was high enough that they could take off their masks and sing without the aerosols having endangered anyone else around them. So all eight of the singers were in their own boxes and then each had a sitting instrument in their respective boxes. It could be a folding beach chair or, or a stool or an armchair. And all the staging was done around that. It was incredible. Wow. And what about the Carmen in Orlando? Carmen was on stage and um, all the rehearsals were with masks until we got with orchestra on stage. And there was a small chorus of 10 and as though who were on stage. And then there was a chorus of about 20 others that was off stage that was singing amplified and trying to coordinate with the monitor that had, a, a, of course, a delay because it's digital monitor. And then it had to co coordinate with me conducting 10 choristers who are on stage. Wow. It's difficult enough just to coordinate a backstage right. on the or chorus with orchestra. Now you add another element of people singing exactly the same thing as you are. It was very challenging. Complicated. We made, it, we made it work as best as we could. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, I'm certainly starting to see as we all are, you know, that, that things are, are definitely coming back to life more and more with, with a variety of different organization so hopefully this will this will pass soon enough but what a what a bizarre time to look back on in years to come you know like i'm sure there will be books i'm sure there will be <laughs> <laughs> uh so what let's say this let's let's wrap up with this what are you is there a piece that you have yet to conduct that is on your dream list like maybe a top three something that you're really put it out there in the universe that that's going to happen. What do you, what do you want to do? Number one is dead man walking. There you go. Because I was assistant conductor at opera Pacific in the very second pr production of dead man walking that was done after San Francisco. Right. And I helped edit the vocal score and I helped edit the, the full score. Oh, wow. And it has been something that's been close to my heart since then. I've had, and I covered it in Cincinnati when Stefan Lano was conducting but I've never had a chance yet to conduct it. I've been dying to do so. So I'm putting wow. that out in the universe. The uh, Flight, Jonathan Dubb's Flight is an oh, opera yeah. that I'd love to do. And of course, every conductor's dream is Rosen Cavalier. So that's definitely on the list too. Sure, sure. Wow, yeah, such cool pieces. I mean, I've, I've, uh, I've been in the audience of, um, of those, but uh, yeah, such interesting pieces. I, I had a student of mine in the um, Heggy world premiere at Marilla, the uh, If I Were You. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just, I just love his writing. I think, I think it's so, so fantastic. And I've seen the Dead Man Walking a few, few times. Um, and it's just, it's such a, such a powerful piece. And having that kind of relationship with it, I'm sure that you're, that you're aching to get, get a chance at it. That's, that's, yeah. that's cool. And the, the cast was also amazing. Uh, of course, Flicka did her main role, John Packard, um, his original role. And we had, the brilliant Chris Jepsen oh, as wow. Sir Helen. Oh, wow. And wow. such a powerful performance and honest. And that's the voice I hear in my head when I when I hear that piece. You know, she was um, my, I think it was my, uh, uh, this is my second year as an apprentice in Santa Fe. Chris was singing Sesto and Joyce DiDonato was singing Anio. Anio, yes. And I was just in love with both of them, had the biggest crushes on them, still do, you know, just love, love Joyce. And I would go into the dressing room and be like, hey, ladies, what's going on? And they're like, oh, hey, what's... 
creeper. <laughs> I know. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. No, no, it was good. It was, I mean, Joyce was the one who also introduced me to um, Marie Lynn, the videos of the uh, 1980, you know, the, the mm -hmm. lady who had the public access cable show. <laughs> I remember I was there that summer um, to watch that performance, and then I of have a the, relationship. Of the Clemenza? Of Clemenza, yes. Oh, I yeah, was. Okay. I think I was scouting for Opera Pacific at the time, okay. and but I have a relationship with them and walking with Joyce too because uh, I think she was preparing for the New York City Opera production, oh, yeah. which was going to be her debut of the role, and she wanted to sing through it. And I, she was in Santa Fe that summer, and I she asked if I could coach her on the role, and you know Joyce is so brilliant. She. She plays the piano so well and teaches everything. We basically went through the role I think, entirety in one city. It must have been a two-hour coaching or three-hour coaching max. It's like this thing here, this thing here, know, know yeah. this about this. That was it. That was all that really needed to be done Wow! <laughs> because she had learned it so well. And I was just so impressed Yeah. Um, from that experience. But anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, um, the goal, I guess, is to surround yourself with colleagues artists you know who who are who are brilliant and i don't know you know it, 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 it's it's kind of a crazy magical thing that happens when you sort of find yourself in those music making moments with people who you don't only you know respect them for their you know musicianship and their even their artistry but you also you know love them as people and and really connect with individuals and uh, that's what I have really, really miss and really, really want to get back to do. So if you need a baritone, let me know, man. I, I would love to work with you again. So we just got to put, put a project out there and it's going to happen. Absolutely. Well, listen, toy, toy, toy for your performances this weekend. Out in, Thank you. Out in, uh, it's a great in program. Vermont. Looking forward. Yeah. And um, don't be a stranger. Let's, 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 let's hook up again. Maybe. Absolutely. Maybe not in an airport, but maybe. <laughs> That sounded so dirty. I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> PF Chang's, it's a date, wherever we are. Wherever we are. Yeah, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. That's good. Yeah. All right, man. Well, awesome. I hope you have a great rest of your Friday and uh, a, a fantastic uh, weekend of performances and safe travels back to wherever you're going. Thank you very much, Weston. Right, Always man, a pleasure. Take care. Take care. Right. Bye.